Okay. Welcome to the session Science and Innovation for Food Systems Serving People and Planet. Excellencies, colleagues and friends. This is um, a session chaired um, by my colleague Magdalena Skipper, Editor-in-Chief of the highly respected journal Nature. And by me, I'm Joachim von Braun, the chair of the Food System Summit Scientific Group. The session will have three blocks. We alternate in chairing. And um, let me just make uh, two brief remarks up front. We had the science days three weeks ago, organized by the scientific group co-hosted uh, with FAO. We feel it was a very successful meeting a series of meetings in a week. Now we have the challenge to aggregate and focus even further. Focus science for the summit. My hope is that we can identify milestones on the way to the summit and identify targets which policymakers could uh, identify with targets related to science. Let me, at this stage, uh, call on Magdalena Skipper and uh, take over and introduce the first block. Magdalena, are you ready? Thank you. Thank you, Joachim. It's a great pleasure to be here. Of course, although I am joining you from London. I wish I could have been uh, with all of you in Rome. Um, let me say a few words uh, to, to frame this session from, from my perspective. You know, the, the importance of starting these pre-summit meeting with a plenary session on science and innovation cannot be overstated. It's incredibly gratifying to see that the UN Secretary General and then subsequently the UN Special Envoy in calling for the Food Systems Summit recognized the importance of science and innovation in the way out of the current crisis. For someone like me who leads a scholarly journal with a 150 year history, this is incredibly important as a recognition. What has also been recognized, of course, in the run up to the summit and is reflected in our session today is the fact that for science and innovation to be effective, to make a genuine contribution to the necessary food systems transformation, they need to play out in a context and on a local and global scale alike. And the best, the most effective implementation will come from co-creation, collaboration, knowledge exchange and continued dialogues between scientists innovators, politicians, policymakers, indigenous people, businesses, farmers and fishing communities, and of course, consumers everywhere. Uh, it's an opportunity, in fact, for each of these stakeholder groups to learn for a better collective outcome. And so, if I may, I'd like to move us straight away to the first uh, segment of our uh, session today. Um, and in this first segment, we will focus on emerging innovations, specifically in bioscience, digital science, and agronomy. We will discuss how they can be put to work effectively to transform food systems. And we will carefully consider how potential risks and unintended consequences can be minimized. Um, and furthermore, what ethical considerations need to be taken into account when implementing them. And a reminder to all of the participants, whether you are in the room or you are joining us virtually, please pose your questions to the panelists in the chat, and we will hope to have an opportunity to address them later. So I would first I'd like to call on uh, Professor Louise Fresco, who is uh, Vice Chair of the Scientific Group and President of the Executive Board at Wageningen University. Professor Fresco, amongst the science and innovation areas discussed in the session here, so bioscience, 
digital sciences and agronomy. Where do you see the greatest potential and how could it be actually mobilized? Professor Fresco, are you with us? I know you have joined us. I have seen you online. Professor Fresco, can you hear me? I can see you in the audience. Yes, so I can, can hear you. Great. Okay. Well, um, I could not unmute myself, so I couldn't help this. Uh, shall I repeat the question, or are you ready to make your intervention? Um, please repeat the question, if you don't mind. So I wanted to, to start off with a, with a very general question for you, focusing on the bioscience, uh, digital sciences, and agronomy um, innovation. Where do you see the greatest potential and, and how they could be actually mobilized in practical terms? I think the greatest potential is actually in the combination of the advances in genetics with the combinations um, that we can get with digital. And let me get you um, a very clear example here, and that is uh, the use of better genomic information, not so much to create genetically modified organisms, but to better characterize the genes so that we know what types of resistance are possible, for example, in plants and animals, or what types of requirements there are in terms of human health. Creating big databases for that will really change the world in many ways. But there are other areas which may seem a little bit less remote for the consumer or for the farmer, and that is, for example, the use of engineering and digital when it comes to electrically powered small-scale irrigation or the very precise application of um, fertilizers on uh, in the root zone, particularly also biofertilizers that, that use compounds from ecosystems such as fungi and so on to mobilize nutrients. And the bottom line of both the genetics and the digital is the keyword precision. What we will be moving to is a more precise type of agriculture, a more precise food chain where we can also trace and monitor what happens to foodstuffs and a more precise targeting of the, um, the needs of consumers. And yes, this is still going to be complicated, but the advances are very rapid, particularly, of course, in digital and genetics. And I think we have a great scope to turn this to the better for poorer populations and also for poor farmers. Would you like me to go on? or? Maybe let me fill the void while we are waiting. One of the things people should realize when it comes to science is that it's extremely important to understand why, um, you know, sometimes technology also has a negative impact, or at least why people feel it has a negative impact. And that has to do, of course, very much with um, the fact that science, like anything else, is a learning process. So yes, for example, science has been absolutely crucial when it comes to uh, enhancing yields and get a more sustainable production over the last few decades or the last century. Yes, at the same time, we have often applied too much fertilizer, we have often applied too many chemicals. but. As if you see science as a self-cleansing process where intersubjectively we can define what are the best outcomes, we have great hope, I think, as scientists for the application of science also to issues of food and nutrition, as well as sustainable production and environment all throughout the world. So I hope that, that the member countries of the UN and consumers worldwide and farmers, of course, and everybody involved in processing will be part of that process of creating the best possible science for the future. Um, and then let me say my last statement, so then we hopefully will solve this problem. Um, I think one of the reasons why we have a, a relative um, 
backlog in a way in science compared to some other areas or in science in agronomy in biosciences for food and agriculture is that it's it is of course a more complex area and home for example biodiversity or or climate in some ways but also we have missed the opportunity i think at, in rio at 1992 to really uh, get ourselves together as a world community and also agree on the way forward to include science in policy and moving towards a science-based policy framework, I think, would be a, a really important outcome of the of the summit. And as a scientific group, and here I speak on behalf of Joachim and my colleagues, we would really welcome exploring the possibility of getting a more science-based type of agreement or something that can underpin the science in future policy making, which is, as you said yourself, both global and local when it comes to food and agriculture. Thank you very much. Um, and I have just experienced your own problem from a second ago, being unable to unmute myself. Um, but you, it's allowed you to make some really fantastically important points, specifically about the innovation and this keyword precision at whatever level, in whatever aspect um, uh, it's applied to. And then, of course, that uh, comment about the importance for science-led policy. And we will come back. Uh, to this issue in, in further discussion. I would next like to call on Professor Elizabeth Hudson uh, de Jeremio, and perhaps the organizers can help us uh, unmute Professor Hudson already. Uh, she is Professor Emerita at the School of Sciences of the um, Pontificia Universidad uh, Javeriana, and also the member of uh, Inter-American Network of Academies of Sciences. So, Professor Hudson, my question to you is, how could food systems transformations be integrated into a circular bioeconomy? And, and where do you see the greatest potential to support this shift towards this circular bioeconomy? Thank you very much for inviting me to this session. Uh, as we all know, food systems represent the major economic niche and employment source. Science and technology will contribute enormously to the transformation of food systems. Uh, in our scientific group, the document Science for Transformation of Food Systems describes clearly in action for bioscience and digital innovations for improving people's health, enhancing systems of productivity, and restoring ecological well-being. This means that the name of the game is Bioeconomy and Technology Convergence, which is Agriculture 4.0, combining bioscience, digital innovation, social and cognitive sciences. The circular bioeconomy model for territorial efficient conversion of resources into value-added product is the smartest choice for the SDGs, which implies a multi-party decision and requires the definite participation of all the actors in the system. Bioeconomy is an engine for food security, socioeconomic reactivation, to mitigate climate change, to reduce waste and residues for the development of new bioproducts in different sectors, and to promote resilience contributing to environmental protection. Transformation to circular bioeconomy is mainly a political process with winners and losers, which involves choices, consensus, as well as compromise about new directions, new values and pathways in order to succeed. Science and technology-based innovation must be in synergy with policy and institutional innovations. They complement and they need each other. All the stakeholders must be involved and proactive in this process. It must be a community, territorial, bottom-up process where the decisions must be local and adapted to the condition and resources, and especially combining appropriately scientific and traditional knowledge and good practices as well. The changes must be first cultural, Therefore, it needs raising awareness, communication, and education. The integration of 
bioeconomy and food systems involves the development of integrated articulated value chains in successive cycles in cascade, which increases efficiency and recycling through products and co-products in, in different biological systems to produce more with less. In relation to the greatest potential to support uh, uh, the, the shift uh, to circular bioeconomy, I would say that promoting the increase of agrobiodiversity by using local nutritious varieties adapted to difficult conditions which may add nutritive value and increase resilience. Fostering residue and waste transformation into value-added products. The development of agricultural bioinputs, such as biofertilizer, biocontrols. The sustainable intensification of agriculture and strengthening the study and use of soil microbiomes as a major game changer in sustainable agricultural production and circular bioeconomy to support digitalization and precision agriculture to produce more with less. Specific science opportunities for innovations include, of course, genetic engineering, genome editing, alternative proteins like more plant-based proteins and insect proteins, biofortification and essential micronutrient technologies, uh, cell factories, microbiome and soil and plant health technologies, plant nutrition technologies, animal production and health technologies, and aquatic food technologies, of course. And I think this is a, a short summary. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much. A, a number of really diverse and important uh, um, lessons here, uh, keywords that ring through my uh, mind right now is, of course, fostering agro biodiversity synergy uh, right across uh, different uh, sectors um, and, um, and very emphatically producing more with less combined with making decisions locally and feeding into that uh, global picture. Thank you again. Uh, now I would like to call on Dr. Lee Recht, uh, who is head of uh, sustainability at um, Aleph Farms. Um, Dr. Recht, um, we'd like to know more about the science behind cultured meat and its sustainability and nutrition aspects. What innovations are needed and how can they be scaled to provide affordable access to cultured meat as a healthy food? So, um, thank you very much. Um, so, uh, Aleph Farms is, is a food company headquartered in Israel that we develop a, what we call cultivated, some say cultured, some say cultivated uh, beef steaks. And the concept of cultivated meat is defined by growing meat products directly, directly from um, their building blocks, the cells, rather than the entire animal. And that will allow consumers to maintain uh, their culinary, nutritious, and sensory qualities of meat and eliminating the need for the major uh, behavioral shift of removing meat from the central parts of our diet. The core concept behind this technology is the tissue regeneration process, which naturally occurs in all animals. Tissues uh, continuously renew themselves by reproducing cells to repair and maintain overall health. Cultivated meat replicates this process under control conditions, eliminating the need for antibiotics and allowing us actually to control the nutritional value of our products through how we feed ourselves. This process also con uh, consumes only a fraction of time and resources required for, uh, for conventional meat production with a minimal impact on the environment. It reduces the timeline of farm to fork to approximately three to four weeks as compared to an average of about two years using conventional methods of producing meat. And this sharp cut in product supply time offers the market a tremendous advantage in resiliency and the flexibility to adapt to markets needs, especially in times of crisis. And we really saw this in COVID-19. Now, Aleph Farm is a big believer in the importance of an inclusive solution for the transition to resilient and sustainable meat sector. We actually believe that in the center of the meat sector are the livestock farmers. 
And while it is important for the meat sector to transition from industrial methods to more sustainable agricultural pra practices, a gap remains between the limited meat production capability of sustainable agriculture and the growing global demand for meat. And we believe that cultivated meat can be part of that solution for that gap. And this is, of course, together with other types of innovation, whether they're incremental or transformational, together with policymakers, and also, of course, together with responsible education to consumers for responsible consumption of not only meat, but in general, a healthy diet. Thank you, and thank you for placing all, all of this in, the, in a context where we have to remember about diversity of solutions and that need of flexibility, um, especially at times of crisis, as you just uh, mentioned. Um, thank you again. I will now like to uh, call on Dr. Manuel Otero, who is Director General at uh, Inter-American Institute for Cooperation on Agriculture. Uh, Dr. Otero, which innovations in land use, crop and livestock systems of the Latin America and the Caribbean region do you see as having high potentials to contribute to transformation of food systems towards sustainability and systems resilience? And which food systems policies should have the highest priority? And what role does trade play for your regions in particular? Gracias a todos. Yes, uh, thank you very much for the uh, invitation. I'll be speaking from my perspective as the Director General of the Inter-American Institute for Agricultural Cooperation. This is an institution which is nearly 80 years old, and it uh, joins the efforts of 34 different countries in the Americas. Since its very uh, start, it's been working for the transformation of agro-food systems. It's a region of the world which, through its history, its uh, trends, its record, uh, resources, in any uh, future scenario that uh, will be playing a key role from a strategic point of view, in terms of making sure that we do strike the new balances in the world, in terms of production and food, and also when it comes to environmental questions in light of climate change. In this context, I'd like to just stress that uh, since the Secretary General, Antonio Guterres, made his call for this summit, we have been very involved uh, through this period of 14 months. We have been trying to bring our contributions to this summit. And this process uh, came to a regional consensus around 16 global messages. And these are very important. Now, as you might imagine, in our continent, we have large countries, we have smaller countries, we have exporting countries, we have countries which import. Uh, food products, countries that are very vulnerable to climate change, that don't have really much responsibility for the uh, uh, causes, countries that are tropical countries, others in temperate zones, all have uh, made an effort then to try and achieve a consensus. Now, in this framework, and trying to go to the first question that you put, it's uh, message number nine that uh, is very important. This mentions that uh, we have to look at the biological sciences, uh, digitalization, and other areas of science. These should open new opportunities, which we had never really imagined before to try and re-strike balances between production uh, and keep in mind the social, the economic, and the environmental objectives of our societies in this time. And in this area, I'd like to mention that the last 30 years in our region, we have registered great progress in the areas of the application, for example, of biotechnology and uh, biosecurity, too, of course and then also more conservative agricultural practices and looking at how um, the most recent efforts to try and develop better forestry and uh, livestock uh, policies, trying to look at better ways to raise our crops and uh, to raise livestock. I'd like to stress that biotechnology and digital farming and the health of our soils are areas that need to be priority efforts, areas of our efforts. 
We need to build a new future for these 16.5 uh, million family farmers we have in our countries. Their uh, lives, their communities are based upon their lives in the community or the rural areas. We need safe and healthy food, and we're going to need to have healthy rural communities as part of that effort. Much of the health in our cities will depend upon how we practice agriculture in these rural areas. Now, I'd like to conclude by making a comment about the importance of uh, international world trade. If we're going to try and strengthen up our uh, food and agricultural systems, well, we've got to produce what consumers want. And that's why the ministers of, the, of agriculture in our countries, among other messages, approved one, world trade needs to be open, transparent, and predictable. That's at the very heart of having a world food system which is going to be efficient, and it's got to be based upon multilateral standards which can promote uh, the liberalization of agriculture while reducing restrictions, be they tariff or non-tariff barriers. So we really do want to stress that uh, the uh, producers need to be heard, they need to be at the center of our debates. Second point, as has been said by others, science is key to produce more and have better policies. And finally, that agriculture is part of the solution. It's going to be a key for building a better future in all of our countries. Thank you. Thank you very much um, for that perspective uh, from um, a particular and, and very important uh, part of the world. So in bringing this session to a close, I just want to summarize that we heard about this multitude of different scientific discoveries and innovations and how they can make an important contribution. And we had um, important emphasis on precision of um, research and development and application, um, very important messages of synergy and different sectors and partners coming together um, as well as um, diversity of solutions and uh, flexibility. Um, in the interest of time, I'm going to hand over straight away to uh, Joachim for his reflections um, on what we just heard from the four uh, panelists. Joachim. <clears throat> Thank you very much, Magdalena. Uh, a great session which you just concluded. Um, let me first call on the next members, uh, set of uh, panelists, uh, and ask them to come up to the stage. Uh, I thank you, Manuel, for uh, great um, uh, interventions, um, and I release you from the panel. I look forward to hopefully have a coffee in the next session. Um, I ask Claudia Sadov to step up um, on the stage, uh, Paul van der Locht. Um, and um, um, uh, Polina Schulbaeva uh, to join me up here. Virtually um, have stepped up to the stage um, Godfrey Bahigwa, the director of the Department of Rural Development, African Union Commission, and um, Kausa Afsana, uh, vice chair of the scientific group. Um, Afsana, I will give you the floor right away. Um, as first speaker, um, because you are furthest away from us. Um, Afsana is uh, the, uh, a professor in the James Grant uh, School of Public Health of Brock University in Bangladesh. Can we switch on Afsana in Bangladesh, please? Technology, please. While we are looking at this clock over there, um, let me remind speakers that this clock is, of course, uh, accurate, but you have been asked to speak for three minutes, not five minutes. And um, we have already some questions um, shared with us. We would love to have audience, especially also virtual audience involved. Uh, 
may I ask for technical support, switch on Professor Afsana, Bangladesh, now. Uh, I you have the here. floor. Sorry, you are only behind me. Go ahead. Thank you very much for inviting and uh, greetings from Bangladesh. And uh, I know that uh, I really wanted to speak about what Bangladesh has been doing. And we know that there are great examples uh, globally. Uh, but uh, let me share some experience from Bangladesh that are actually imperative to augment availability, affordability, and uptake of nutritious food among women. So Bangladesh, in many ways, was, has made remarkable uh, progress in economic growth, literacy, and life expectancy over five decades after its inception. Despite all those improvements, undernutrition is still prevalent in Bangladesh among children, women, adult populations, and obesity, on the other hand, is also on rise. Women, the government, along with the non-governmental organizations and private sectors, has invested in research, policy, implementation for increasing food production and crop diversification, including nutrient-dense food production. So it means that food production and diversity of food is going up to a great extent. However, availability and affordability of healthy diets that you have been all struggling, it is, is a huge problem, including the consumer awareness about nutrition. On the other hand, that COVID-19 has interrupted, we have been discussing and we experiencing that how actually it is interrupting the rising growth and development in my own country, Bangladesh, and indeed in other countries as well. However, women are always, always the center of development in this country's agenda. National uh, policy uh, of women's development emphasized women's empowerment and gender equality in economy, education, employment, agriculture, and food production, business, including social protection for women. So there are examples from the government, the government's investment in enhancing engagement of women farmers in rural economy, especially in agriculture, poultry, fish, and livestock. And in Bangladesh, actually 60 to 70% women, uh, the farmers are women. And we sometimes forget this issue. But Bangladesh also has great examples of public-private partnership. The contribution of NGOs is immense in women's empowerment. The NGO that I worked over 26 years is called BRAC in Bangladesh. It has a flagship program, which is called the Ultra Poor Graduation Program, which is a social protection program supporting millions of extreme poor women, providing them for tools for changing their livelihood empowering them with information, resources, and enhancing their self-esteem and confidence. That's very critical for women's empowerment. But what happened that women on occasions are undervalued? But what we have been seeing that a rising enrollment of girls in secondary school is bringing some positive change. Women's education is associated with improved food behavior and practices and hence the better health and nutrition outcome that we are observing in our life and in all the literature that we have, we have uh, accumulated over the years. But unfortunately, the existing social norms and rules push girls getting married very, very early, leading to their dropout from high schools. The role of science here is very, very important to drop, identify the effective ways to eliminate the social barriers and creating opportunities for women in labor market and skill-based job. So for women's empowerment and gender equality, more institutional innovations are needed, especially how to enhance women's education, how to keep them in the school, how to give them vocational training, how to access the financial resources, stimulus for business, access to technology that we have been discussing I think for the last two sessions, and this is very critical issue. So researchers and policymakers, and even the practitioners from varied disciplines and sectors, including the private sectors, NGOs, civil society, community, 
and indigenous people. We must all work together to do more innovations for women's empowerment, especially augmenting their contribution to climate resilient agriculture and food systems. And Bangladesh, one of the country that we are actually struggling with this climate change. So achieving SDGs, <laughs> that is our goal, will only be possible if we are all together. And that's so important. And so we have to be together and we have to be more innovative in using the evidence-based informed decisions and actions for women's empowerment. And then we can make the world more inclusive and respectful and protect our mother earth and planetary health and Thank create a better world for now Thank and you, for Asana. the next seven generations. Thank, Thank you. you. Very, thank you very much. Um, colleagues, um, um, pressed for time, uh, let me raise, however, a question to be kept in mind, which uh, reached us uh, from the chat box. Um, and uh, if you find uh, a moment cutting from your prepared speech um, addressing that, what are the financial costs and time frames required for transitioning from the current food system to a sustainable, diverse and innovative technological system? The time frame. Um, Claudia, you will tell us, uh, Claudia Sadov, uh, Managing Director, uh, Research Delivery and Impact of the CGIR system organization, you will tell us about the role of the CGIR in uh, pursuing this agenda. But maybe you can also talk about time and sense of urgency, please. Thank you, Joachim. Um, the, the question in the chat box is, is so important, and I think this question of urgency is one that we do not know yet how long it will take because we're still seeking solutions, but we must begin immediately because it's clear from all the discussions we've been having here that we're not yet on the right path. At the CGIR, we believe firmly that a radical realignment is needed of our food systems in order to really help end hunger and malnutrition in all of its forms. We also believe quite strongly that food systems are situated in the solution space for climate adaptation and climate mitigation, as well as environment and biodiversity. And transforming our food systems, therefore, provides us an extraordinary opportunity to create uh, integrated solutions that really cut across so many of the key global challenges that we face. These that I've mentioned, as well as uh, gender equality, inclusion, and livelihoods. But the agricultural research and innovation that is in process that we still need is essential to enable the transformation that we all want to see. Not just to discover a menu of solutions, but to really understand the context of those solutions, their trade-offs, their synergies, a more integrated way of thinking and working, like the One Health construct. And as these challenges are evolving, becoming more complex and more interconnected, the CGIR is also evolving in response. We're forming a newly reforming One CGIR, which is a reformulation of our capabilities and our global field-based presence and partnerships so that our 10,000 staff in 70 countries can work better together and more effectively to create a systems transformation at scale. We've already put this practice into, uh, in, into our approach to a COVID-19 response hub, which brings together all of our capacities in the global response and recovery to the pandemic. But looking ahead, how will CGIR contribute to SDGs in this decade? We have a new research and innovation strategy that is our blueprint for the contribution. And what we're focusing on is three interconnected areas where we believe that the world needs scalable solutions that are based on science. The first is genetic innovations. The focus on conservation of genetic resources and better breeding for productivity and for resilience. The second is resilient agri-food systems for more sustainable, integrated and landscape-based approaches to food production. And finally, we need to look at the meta-system scale. We need to look at the economic, social, and environmental frameworks and policies within which our food system functions. So we intend to work in these three areas globally. We intend to take the insights, the research, the innovations 
from those three areas and apply them in regionally integrated initiatives on the ground, and in this way, help develop the science and the innovations and the partnerships that we need to transform our food, our land, and our water systems in the context of a climate crisis. So building on our 50-year track record of agricultural research and innovation, and partnerships in the field with so many of you attending this uh, summit here today, the CGIR is reforming itself in order to respond to this next generation of challenges. We look forward to this week's discussions with all of you, and we look forward to being a more impactful and uh, integrated partner in science moving forward to implement the ideas that are being discussed and launched at this so very critical UN Food System Summit. Thank you, Joachim. Thank you very much. Quite an agenda, a lot of innovation in the CGIR system, um, and um, uh, we will with excitement follow that. Uh, Paul van der Locht, Head uh, Food and Nutrition Security, Ministry of Foreign Affairs, uh, the Netherlands. Paul, your expectations of the UN Food System Summit and what will the government of the Netherlands bring to the table? Thank you very much. Of course, our expectations are very high as, uh, as of all of us. I think the question about like when should this be uh, effective is already answered uh, by those that went before us in uh, for the SDG. So in 2030, we have targets set on zero, uh, zero hunger. We have climate targets. So this is uh, this is a uh, very uh, very urgent, and 2030 is uh, is our key milestone. Um, so um, what can we bring? I think of course like the the analysis is always very very proud of, of the food system that we have, so we love talking about it. Um, but I want to uh, focus my intervention not so much on the science bit, um, I don't know whether Louise is still online, but of course uh, Wageningen uh, is one of our uh, cornerstones uh, in our food system, but um, the success of the, of the Dutch food system is not only the science, um, it's the interaction with its farmers, uh, with its business, uh, and with government. Um, and I think that, uh, uh, Joachim, you asked also, like, uh, can we set targets? Uh, but these are moving targets. This is a process and, uh, uh, and an interaction between different actors uh, that creates an enabling environment uh, for growth in agriculture, but also uh, for change. Um, and I think that's something that we very much need uh, now. Um, and that is also happening. I think Wageningen is, 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 I think, also leading that in uh, extending the research agenda uh, uh, increasingly towards nutrition uh, environment. We have one CG center in Wageningen uh, focusing on, uh, on climate change. I think that interaction is what we need uh, in the Netherlands, uh, but that we also need uh, globally. Um, the high level of adoption uh, among the, the off-takers of science, um, there's also a high level of adoption of research questions from the field in our uh, research uh, and science community. Um, and I think that's something that, that's, and that should not just be business and, and uh, the public sector, but it should also very much be civil society. And I think uh, I commend the, uh, the summit on their efforts to make sure that civil society uh, uh, is part of the process. But I think we haven't succeeded there yet, and we should, uh, it is an absolute must have uh, if we are to succeed in this uh, agenda. Uh, this is what we bring to the summit, but we also uh, bring the challenges that we face currently in the Netherlands with uh, our food system. Uh, we, uh, as many, I think, of us ran, ran into the limitations, the environmental limitations, um, due to uh, especially nitrogen uh, emissions, um, but also increasingly uh, the awareness of environmental um, uh, footprint, uh, both in the Netherlands uh, and internationally. Um, and dealing with that challenge, and I think the, uh, the national dialogues really helped us uh, uh, to start that dialogue. We're, we're currently in the middle of um, uh, forming a, our next government. Um, the, the previous, uh, the current one also set the agenda for a more sustainable agricultural system and food system. Um, but the next one, I think, can really be uh, inspired by the national dialogue that we had, where a lot of the parties said, yes, we want to uh, work towards uh, and work together on a more uh, sustainable system. And I really hope, but that's a personal opinion, that that will not be an agriculturally focused uh, discussion, 
but a food system focused discussion so that we also include logistics, uh, markets, consumers uh, and health in that discussion uh, to make, um, uh, to, to decide on which uh, scenarios to follow. Um, I think um, on the international side, uh, well, the CG, we were, very, uh, we were a big supporter of the CG, and I think the one CG is really what we need. I think if we need one target, maybe we should say that 50% of all research should be sort of cross-sectoral, that it's not possible anymore to just look at one part of the food system, but really sort of uh, dive into the consequences for other parts of it. Um, on uh, the institutional arrangement, I think that's part of the next block, but I, I, I can't help commenting on it. I think we, we have so much um, funding and investments available for research um, that it's a, a shame that we cannot be, make that uh, effort more binding for uh, policymakers uh, uh, and businesses and, and markets uh, to take up that research um, and uh, reorient um, our efforts. Um, so I, I echo what has been said by uh, many, that we should really look at how we can organize the science into the international arrangement. And um, the science group has been a great effort. Maybe we should just stay on and uh, help us uh, in this process going forward. Um, on innovation, I want to mention... Uh, uh, oh, am I over? Uh, okay. Uh, I want to then I'll go to the, uh, my uh, final point, and that's just echoing um, uh, Dr. Kalibata uh, that this is the beginning of a process, and we're committed uh, to stay on uh, and get the science bit right. Thank you very much. Thank you, Paul. Um, you and the Netherlands belong on this panel because you are carrying a secret. How come we in agricultural economics are puzzled by that? The country with the highest factor productivity maintains the highest growth rate in agriculture. Um, it's a puzzle, um, and this goes on since decades. You need to share that with this community and elsewhere, and not keep it as a secret. Thank you for uh, bringing in a set of uh, key agenda items. Let me read one more uh, question uh, from uh, the floor. How can smallholder farmers, low-income producers and consumers and the marginalized, including women, indigenous communities be put at the center of policy and institutions from, for bottom-up transformation instead of top-down? We heard already a little bit about that from Bangladesh. We now call on Dr. Godfrey Bahigwa, Director, Department of Rural Economy and Agriculture of the African Union Commission. Godfrey, you have the floor. Yeah, thank you, Joachim. Um, happy to be here, and thank you for inviting the African Union Commission to share some thoughts. Uh, just as a preamble, um, uh, the African Union Commission, or the African Union in general, uh, is coming to the, uh, this UN Food System Summit with uh, a common position. We have mobilized all our 55 member states um, to develop a common position uh, with key ideas and thoughts uh, that we can share with the, the rest of the world. Secondly, um, as some of you may know, um, the African Union member states um, adopted uh, what is popularly known as the Comprehensive Africa Agriculture Development Program, CADA, in 2014 with the clear sets of goals and targets to be achieved by 2025. Uh, and now we are in 2021. The, a recent report that was um, released and adopted by heads of state last year indicated that Africa is not on track to achieve its goals and targets by 2025. So the Food System Summit um, for, for us as a continent is coming at a time where we are asking ourselves what we need to do to enhance the pace of implementation of the Comprehensive Africa Agriculture Development Program. And so in mobilizing our member states for this um, uh, UN Food System Summit, uh, what they have put together as a common position uh, are basically ideas and thoughts about what is required to transform food systems in Africa in order to achieve both the continental goals 
around food security, incomes, uh, nutrition, uh, poverty, and so on, along with those of the UN Sustainable Development Goals. So that's a preamble. Um, now, with regards to uh, the application of uh, science uh, in transforming Africa's food systems, uh, a couple of ideas uh, or focus areas on the continent that have emerged as consensus rather around um, the, the use of science to, uh, to promote or to increase yields, crop yields, and animal, and animal uh, uh, product yields uh, on the continent. In particular, with regard to crops to address uh, nutrition uh, deficiencies, um, a key emerging idea is the promotion of biofortification of um, staple foods uh, also augmenting them with industrial food fortification. That is a key priority um, for, for the continent. The other priority is um, um, increasing investment in agricultural research to develop innovations that will sustain uh, agricultural intensification that we see happening across the, across the continent. Um, the third priority that has emerged uh, from the continent is increasing investment in digital uh, infrastructure and capacity building, especially for, for our youth, and also ensuring that women have access to, uh, to these technologies in order to enhance uh, productivity, but also reduce the burden uh, of labor that they, that they, fa that they face, um, uh, because they are the key producers of um, of food on the continent. Lastly, um, is again the application of science with regard to um, harnessing energy um, and water resources on the continent to address the deficiencies, um, especially with regard to mechanization as well as uh, irrigation. So, so these are some of the emerging consensus areas uh, in, in Africa that are contained within our Africa Common Position, the details of which will be presented uh, during this uh, uh, pre-summit. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Patrick. Uh, uh, sorry, uh, uh, Godfrey. Um, there are already a, a number of questions how to mobilize smallholder farming uh, in Africa. And um, those of you who have asked these questions uh, got um, at least the political framing of the answers from uh, Godfrey Bahigua. Let me turn, um, last not least, um, to uh, Paulina Schulbaeva, coordinator uh, of the uh, Indigenous uh, Peoples Initiatives uh, relating also to the CBD process, I understand. Um, and uh, Paulina um, uh, relates to Central Siberia. Um, please take the floor. Thank you very much. I will speak uh, Russian. Yes, one minute. Technical issues. I would like to begin by noting that the indigenous peoples and their traditional knowledge is a very valuable partner for solution, for finding solutions for decision making, for resolving the issue of hunger and ensuring uh, full and uh, secure food supplies. Traditional knowledge, innovative practices of the indigenous peoples together with scientific knowledge have shown their effectiveness already, and this has long been been reflected in various decisions, including at the Biodiversity Convention, the uh, climate agreements, and other agreements and norms that have been elaborated. Now, this knowledge could give us the base for managing ecosystems and the different species, food systems of the indigenous peoples, help us to preserve biodiversity, genetic biodiversity, and ensure the diversity of all of the different systems. We've already heard. The, uh, from uh, 
uh, Professor von Braun about this. He mentioned this, and uh, thank you for mentioning this. Our knowledge is adaptive in nature. It's resilient to change, including the change brought by climate change. And let me note in this respect, the reindeer herders in Russia, in the Arctic regions of Russia, their food systems are based on traditional ecological knowledge. They can fully, uh, pr they, they, they do not pollute, they do not create waste. They, in this fashion, preserve the ecosystem of the region. And so traditional knowledge must be respected, valued. It must be given attention when we are uh, carrying out this dialogue process between science, between the decision makers, it must be taken into account. The indigenous peoples can show us how to achieve more sustainable systems. And we have already heard from our colleagues about how uh, here we need investment to uh, carry out studies on this, conduct the analysis, analysis of the food systems of the indigenous peoples themselves in order to improve the food systems that currently are failing us in order to introduce into these systems, together with the scientific knowledge that we need, the knowledge that will bring us to genuinely effective, sustainable food systems that can be applied and will help us in the future. We need platforms for exchanging the knowledge so that we, using these platforms, can work together and uh, put together the traditional knowledge, the other methods. And I particularly would like to stress that if we look at these statistics, 80%, practically 80% of all of the natural resources, biodiversity, genetic resources, are in the territories where the indigenous peoples live, because the indigenous peoples are stewards of these resources, preserving these resources through traditional methods, including through their traditional food systems. And this makes it possible, not just to preserve it, but to hand it down to coming generations. And so this traditional knowledge, the innovations, the practices of these indigenous peoples must be fully integrated into the decision-making process to reach more sustainable food systems globally. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, uh, colleagues, uh, uh, this session has uh, demonstrated the great diversity and the relevance of innovation in different parts of the food system. Um, I uh, highlight um, the emphasis on, on gender, which we heard, uh, on women from Afsana, um, the transformative role of a large, the leading uh, science system on agriculture focused on uh, development from Claudia, uh, the role of uh, uh, an innovation uh, leader um, the, from the Netherlands, uh, Paul, with a, a strong focus on, on development thinking, and Godfrey's uh, emphasis uh, on the transformative agenda in African smallholder farming. Um, uh, and last not least, uh, uh, Paulina's uh, uh, interesting uh, uh, information about a region uh, in which uh, indigenous people still play a key role and are to play a key role in the future. I would like to hand back to Magdalena for the third block. Magdalena, you have uh, the mic. Thank you. Thank you, Ahim. And uh, I, I have to say that throughout this session just now, really interesting session with different perspectives, what was running through my mind was actually something that you said in the very first morning session, and that is um, that we all need to learn how to share knowledge more equitably. And I think at the different levels that your panelists uh, spoke and with their different emphasis, that uh, information uh, very clearly came through. And indeed, the same message um, applies to our third block, which is focused on science and institutional innovation for uh, food systems uh, sustainability. Um, we want to look at which innovations can be most effective in delivering 
um, transformation of the food system so that the food systems are climate neutral, climate positive, regenerative, and of course protect biodiversity and the environment. And so first, I would like to call on uh, Professor Mahavad Hassan, uh, Vice Chair of the Scientific Group and also President of the World Academy of Sciences for the Advancement of Science in Developing Countries. Professor Hassan, um, what science landscape uh, do we need in the low and middle income countries specifically for a food system that is well supported by science and and what should the role of the academies of science universities and, and national agricultural research uh, be and perhaps most crucially something that um, uh, professor fresco uh, touched on at the very beginning could an ipcc for food make an important contribution thank you very much and uh, good afternoon from khartoum um, to respond to these uh, excellent questions you just mentioned, uh, let me highlight uh, three issues uh, where institutional innovations are indeed very much needed for transition to sustainable food systems. So first, uh, the need to transform food systems research and education institutions, especially those that are universally university-based in low and middle income countries by modernizing their curriculum and research facilities to include frontier innovations in science and technology and their applications to eliminate hunger and increase the availability and affordability of healthy diet. Uh, these include the innovations that were mentioned earlier by my colleagues, genetic engineering, gene editing, digitization, artificial intelligence, robotics, drip irrigation, and so on and so forth. Such modernization of curriculum will also attract talented students to pursue a career in food systems, as has been shown uh, in a number of universities around the world in recent years. In this regard, a regional and international collaboration between universities and research institutions to share best practices and develop joint programs in food systems research and education should also be promoted. There is also a need to develop and strengthen platforms that link university researchers and students to farmers, as well as to national agricultural research systems and international agricultural research centers to empower farmers, exchange practices, and more importantly, develop collaborative programs to bring science and technology innovations to scale through social and business innovations. Second, to build strong links between food system science and policy. This is a question you just asked. By A, supporting merit-based academies of science, both senior and young academies, to deliver independent evidence-based consensus reports with specific recommendations to influence food systems policy. B, examining options for a global intergovernmental science policy interface for sustainable food systems, as was mentioned briefly by Professor Fresco. And C, establishing multidisciplinary dialogue platforms to discuss synergies and trade-offs between food systems and other interconnected global systems, including climate, biodiversity, desertification, and health. And third, to develop innovative finance models that leverage government, ODA, and private resources to increase funds to food systems research and education. Uh, this is very important and I was discussing in detail at the plenary session. But the scientific group, for example, recommends that at least 1% of the national agricultural GDP should be allocated to food systems science. So with this, I stop here. Thank you. Thank you very much for these um, important points. I will move straight away to the um, next panelist, uh, Professor Thomas Hertel, uh, Professor of Agricultural Economics at Purdue University and Executive Director of Global Trade Analysis Project. 
Uh, Professor Hertel, um, what trade arrangements, uh, uh, arrangements should the UN Food System Summit change or strengthen? Um, and what can comprehensive models tell us about resilience effects of proposed big policy changes, such as, for example, repurposing agricultural subsidies or adopting healthy diets? Okay, well, thanks for this opportunity to share a few observations on food system institutional reforms. I'm drawing heavily on the scientific group's strategic paper, and actually I'm going to start out by uh, picking up on a few of the remarks that were made earlier, trade-offs and synergies and whatnot, um, and then transition into the trade question. So ending hunger and ensuring healthy diets for all, cornerstones of SDG 2, are synergistic with many other SDGs. For example, adequate health is essential if those receiving a complete diet are to avoid nutritional deficiencies, and adequate nutrition is critical in determining long-run health. However, achievement of SDG 2 also poses challenges, most notably on the environment front, and we've already heard a bit about that, for example, in the Netherlands. More food requires more land, more water, potentially more fertilizer, encroachment on nature is, has been significant and resulting in significant environmental damages. So baseline scenarios from these e economic models project global food demand increasing by as much as 50 percent between today and 2050, and it's driven by population, but also improved diets, overconsumption, and increased food waste. So while most income from yield increases, CGIAR and others contributing to that, uh, this leaves as much as a third to come from cropland expansion, and that's just not sustainable. So to leverage these synergies and navigate the trade-offs, it's necessary to strengthen the interactions between food system scientists and other disciplines. So mobilizing the best available science to inform food systems policies a high priority. And it does, it underscores further the, uh, the need for something like an IPCC for food systems transformation, as has been previously brought up. But even with significant new investments in lower income countries' food systems, economic development um, in, um, economic projections to mid-century suggest a growing gap between countries with strong research and development infrastructure, high agricultural productivity, and Joachim mentioned Netherlands as a prime case there. Um, the poorer regions um, <coughs> are not enjoying that level of productivity growth, don't have that infrastructure, and that's where the population is growing, and that's where the dietary needs have not yet been fully met. So this is and this is further exacerbated by the projected pattern of climate impacts. They're particularly severe across the, uh, across the tropics. So robust international trade has to be a key ingredient of any successful food system transformation, mediating between food surplus and food deficit regions. However, no country wants to be reliant on food imports that can be subjected to export bans during the next global food crisis. This means putting in place a transparent rules-based trading system, echoing points that were made in, the, in an earlier panel. Uh, the potential for markets to be destabilized by government interventions was on dramatic display in the 2007-08 food crisis. This led to establishment of an agricultural market information system that documents on a real-time basis the scope and duration of other governments' interventions. And as a consequence, um, overreactions on the part of policymakers and, and markets also to the COVID pandemic were largely avoided, and this was a big success. But merely documenting these interventions is not enough. We need to go further and establish a new multilateral trade accord in agriculture that will prevent countries from restricting exports during times of food crisis. The international trading system is a global public good, and it has to be protected in the same way we seek to protect other public goods, such as the Earth's climate. Thank you. Thank you very much, um, absolutely. And there's another common thread that is coming across, essentially through all the interventions, that collaboration, that global perspective uh, coming together, uh, all the while keeping the, the local um, needs in mind. Um, I would next like to call on Ms. Sue uh, Kahumbu Stefanou, who is founder and CEO of ICAO. Uh, Ms. Stefanou, um, I hope you are with us uh, online. I believe you are joining us remotely. Um, what 
are your um, experiences with digital innovations for farmers in Africa specifically regarding productivity and equity? And where is ICAO as an organization now and what are the next steps for it? And if I can remind you to be uh, brief in your comments, thank you. Thank you so much um, for the um, opportunity. Um, so just a little bit about what ICAO does. ICAO is a digital platform that um, was designed 10 years ago and it helps to educate farmers in um, climate smart agricultural practices over low end phone, smartphone and the intermediary system, which is um, a, a hybrid of the two. Um, what I'm seeing is that, you know, extension on the ground in most African countries is very scant. We have one extension officer to 50 in Kenya, I think, to 5,000 farmers. We need to look closely at the, 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 um, the gains made through digitized solutions like ICAO, where we're seeing our reach is now up to 1.6 million farmers from a, a cloud-based system that actually has transformed farmers, um, increased their productivity in the dairy sector from um, those dairy farmers from 30 to 60% increase in milk yields. And we're talking about optimizing their systems more than anything else using education. Um, I cannot stress enough how, how in order to do things at scale, and we need to, and we don't need to do it at scale going forward, we should have been doing this already yesterday, 10 decades ago, ago um, we need to rope in our telcos as part of the partners. And I agree uh, with Professor Lewis Fresco, where she spoke about, you know, co-creation, knowledge creation partnerships. When we look at the science and the other partners that we work with in ICAO, we work with the um, International Livestock-Based Research Institution, ILRI, where we do work on the Africa Genetic Gains, which is looking at finding out which are the best optimized livestock for different production systems. We're bringing in Holston Frisians from Holland. They're dying. We've got to have the biggest graveyard for these animals on the continent. Um, we need to look at our genetics, conserve our genetics, and look at how we can optimize those in our food systems. Um, so I could continue, but in the, in the interest of time, I want to talk about something that we're doing um, lately. Um, and I think that the, the initiative is actually looking at something that came from the Africa Dairy Genetic Gain Program. In that program, we looked at empowering extension agents with the ability to go out to reach farmers. COVID turned things around, but they were empowered through the program with motorbikes and tablets, and they went out, collected data. The data came into science, and scientists were able to give um, real-time feedback based on that data into the hands of the farmers through ICAO. But COVID began to change things. And what we've started up just lately in Nairobi is a new initiative called the Border Border um, Soil Advocacy Program. And this is teaching people who already have motorbikes and already have tablets to go out and teach farmers about climate resilience in their soils and coming back to what Professor Luis Fresco said, teaching them to talk about the microbes, teaching them how to look and aim to save the microbial health in soils and actually even to try and measure it without it even coming back to the labs. Although we are again using science and using our partnerships, bringing samples back to analyze what's on the ground and what are we doing going forward, teaching them to, to compost. Three, three, the program is a three month program and it teaches these border soil advocates over Zoom, those that are interested. Soil is a really boring topic, so those that do show interest, you know they're showing interest for, you know, for a purpose, they're passionate about soils in their region. And I'd just like to talk about one example in particular, um, um, two gentlemen, Sammy and Charles, they've been in the program now for three weeks. They're already on the ground doing experiments with farmers, with their communities, sending us back videos. This week, they have got 10 farming communities that are demanding them to come and show them how they did the experiments and what they need to be doing in optimizing their compost and the livestock manures in their compost. So what I'm saying is we need to look at really rethinking our extension models, um, looking at very easy gains and very easy ways to work with agents of change on the ground, passionate agents of, of change. Um, I'm really proud of the group. And we're, like I say, it's a three month program. We're three weeks in and we're seeing tremendous success and multiplying effect from looking at soils from the ground up with the farmers on the ground up. Thank so you. I'll end, I'll end there. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. And, and a wonderful example of education, the importance of education at a different level. Of course, uh, Professor Hassan spoke about education in the university and research context, but here uh, equally importantly. Let me interject with a couple of questions that are coming in. For example, there's one here 
asking research and innovation are costly, uh, limiting um, access to technology uh, in low-income countries and regions. So how can technology and innovations be transferred to low-income regions? And I hope just now some of what uh, Ms. Stefano was talking about um, addressed that question. And in anticipation of the next um, uh, intervention, let me read out this question. What role can global food research institutions such as CGIAR and the FAO play in collaboration with scientists in the private sector? Uh, can a more proactive engagement with private sector expedite innovations for food systems transformation? And this, of course, again speaks to that sharing of knowledge and collaboration right across uh, the different sectors that, again, is a theme which is coming back over and over again. And so now I would like to uh, invite uh, Dr. Patrick uh, Caron, who is there in person, I can see, uh, from University of Montpellier, so, uh, Dr. Caron, your experience of, of research at the interface between research and policy, including, for example, from within the UN Committee on uh, World Food Security, what, in your view, is the most effective path for fruitful research and policy engagement? Perhaps you can give us some examples from your current um, uh, role at uh, CIRAD uh, in, in France. Thank, thank you very much, Mr. Chair. I will, Mrs. Chair, I will uh, speak in French. Uh, bonjour tout le monde. Et en, en Good morning, everyone. Uh, Pleasure to be comme here. Le monde, je crois, les, well, les du groupe scientifique, the scientific committee's group nous et des now does Evite. need to move on to change. Now, we've also heard the fact that we don't have much time. And what we see is a logo everywhere is uh, one that brings a lot of hope. We need to build this, uh, this rainbow that we all want. Uh, this is an invitation to uh, open up things, an invitation to everyone to make it all inclusive. And then also to take uh, and look at food within the other uh, SDGs. So what can scientists do to uh, reply to your uh, question, madam? Well, how can we answer this uh, challenge? We've got to build new technologies. Now, we've been that for a long time. If you look at uh, vaccines, for example, that's an excellent example of uh, adopting innovation. But we've got to do more. Uh, scientific uh, progress, which is absolutely essential, has to be something which is going to mean that tomorrow uh, sings a different tune. We've uh, got to address some very, very complex challenges. This has been referred to, and it differs where you are in the world, too, what the challenges are. We need a transition, one that's going to require a great deal of knowledge. That's a given. And science has a role to play here. We need a transformative uh, technology more than we've had. Now, first of all, there's not uh, innovation on of institutions on the one hand and scientific uh, developments elsewhere. No, you've got to have see the two as being intrinsically linked. We've got to see also protection of uh, private data and then public uh, policies, but that's got to be something that converges too. And we've got to work here to have a new uh, framework in which we work so that those do, who do innovate actually contribute to sustainable development, that local development and uh, world uh, trends uh, uh, mesh. I think about the, wor or the rules on world trade that have been referred to. I think about uh, private rights or rights to intellectual property. It's important that we look at each individual context, and scientists need to roll up their sleeves here with the proper tools. They need to find the proper a way to discuss this with all stakeholders. I do think those, uh, I think of David here, who, uh, and, and I think for also very much that the uh, conference such as this helps. We've got to make it very clear that what the choices are. We've got to look at the territories. We've got to make sure that uh, the decisions which are often are difficult to take can be taken. And, and, and finally, I think about the events of the 4th of February that were organized uh, at the University of Montpellier. Uh, and uh, this was uh, something which is insisted by the French government. There we've got to renew the links between science and government. Often we've seen that uh, scientists get very frustrated in trying to participate as they try to see that their knowledge is not put to good use and does not have an impact on decision takers. 
So, to improve there, we do need a, a new type of science, an unusual science, if you will, a, a true partnership. And we'll do that by going down four avenues. First of all, we need to develop the uh, uh, tools which can actually be put to good use to try and address concerns and uh, look at, uh, also to highlight the, the dangers, look at the obstacles, uh, such as conflicts of interest, uh, power imbalances, and uh, Secondly, we've got to do a better job of developing the models and the knowledge uh, via agro uh, uh, and, uh, farming. We've got to make sure that we can put good, to good use knowledge. We've got to be able to look at future possibilities. Third, we've got to bring on board the different uh, uh, knowledge when it comes to the environment, to the climate, uh, to health, and uh, we've got to go beyond here, uh, just looking at uh, the uh, hygiene practices at present. We've got to look at all the different areas where we can uh, promote synergy there. Fourthly, promote cooperation between science and ambitious programs, which are axed on the main challenges before us. The CIGR is a good example of this, as it reforms its efforts. Houses are burning down. We see this happening. And we're going to need new science. We're going to need a new commitment. We're going to need to change. We're going to need to invest. Invest invest to make certain that our call to uh, arms is taken up so that indeed the rainbows of tomorrow are a reality. We've got to work together to achieve this. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much um, for uh, this uh, challenging, ambitious, but also optimistic list of, of uh, what lies ahead of us. So we've had um, a, a wonderful and powerful uh, set of interventions um, on the need for science and policy to work hand in hand. Cooperation, exchange uh, came up over and over again. And of course, to, to maximize the benefits of science guided policies um, that are inclusive and sensitively um, adapted to local needs, we need also to recognize that institutional reforms are needed, but right across institutions, be they large or small, more regional or, or global. And very clearly, one size will not fit all. So let me make a couple of general uh, comments about, uh, about all three sessions. Uh, first of all, um, my own sincere thanks to all of the distinguished uh, panelists for these insightful um, interventions. It's been a powerful session uh, showcasing how science and innovation can directly inform policy making. Uh, which in turn can change our lives, our health, and of course the health of the planet. Um, and we've all seen that science has been instrumental in the fight to control and reverse climate change. That was something that was mentioned specifically by one of the uh, panelists. And of course, to safeguard biodiversity. The same is true for the food system. Uh, input from diverse, uh, from across diverse science disciplines has a fundamental role in making the food systems healthier and more sustainable, but also crucially more equitable and more resilient. And of course, the ongoing pandemic has illustrated so well to us all the, that um, the effective interventions can only result from policies that are directly informed by science in real time. And um, importantly, my final comment is that this should not be a one-way flow of information. The best outcomes will come from an engaged dialogue. We need to make time to learn one another's language so that we can share the knowledge and maximize its potential for all. This will in turn lead to better food systems but also to better science, uh, something that Dr. Caron just was referring to. Although rightly here, we're focusing on transforming the food system, it's also an opportunity to transform science for now and of course for the future. Um, I will now hand over to uh, Joachim. Thank you. Thank you for this uh, brilliant summing up, uh, Magdalena. Let me... Um, uh, just do two things. One is um, uh, I want to recognize that we have a very uh, powerful and influential community sitting here in this audience. I, Agnes Kalibata, special envoy, was patiently with us uh, practically throughout the whole session. I see the chief scientist of FAO uh, in the first row. 
the Minister of Agriculture from Gambia, who hosted us uh, two years ago with a major think tank meeting in, in Africa, is here. I could go on. I for, forgive me, ladies and gentlemen, excellencies, um, that um, I do not go on. Instead of uh, adding follow-up uh, comments, um, I want to respond to the last question which has come in in my chat box. I read it to you. Research and innovation is costly. That limits access to technology in low-income countries and regions. How can technology and innovations be transferred to low-income regions? I think this question is at the heart of our issues. Let me respond. Research and innovation is costly. My answer is no. The cost-benefit ratio is very low. It's the best investment um, low-income countries, low-income regions can do. That's why the scientific group asks all countries that spend less than 1% of their food system turnover, their food system-related GDP, on research and innovation in order to accelerate. In low-income countries uh, and regions, uh, technology is limited. No, there is so much creativity in low-income countries. So I say no again to the hypothesis formulated in that question. But I agree um, to the question, how can technology and innovation be transferred to low-income countries and regions? That's where we need to really put to task the global and uh, international organizations to facilitate the sharing, the transferring, the cooperation in totally new ways so that the brilliant science from, say, the Netherlands or in the CGIAR reaches smallholder farmers and food value chain actors. Thank you again for your contributions, the excellent presentations which we heard. The journey to the summit goes on and must go on thereafter. Thank you again and goodbye. Thank you.